Hi everyone, it's Alex from Risk Academy and today I'm talking to Brian Whitefield who is uh, who's a very amazing person. He, he was one of the first people I know who made the jump, the leap, the transition from risk management to decision making, understanding that there's surely there's more to risk management and now Brian leads a consulting practice in Sydney um, focusing on helping executives and board members uh, with better decision making. So Brian, thank you for joining for joining me. Thank you very much for uh, asking me. Really re feel really privileged. <laughs> <laughs> now I've uh, I, I grew up in Australia, but I've really been away from the country for probably 10, maybe 15 years. What's been happening in Australia in terms of uh, risk management and kind of stepping out of the just the boundaries of the name risk management, what's been happening with risk-based decision making or decision making in general? Uh, the answer is of course mixed. Um, some organisations have uh, embraced it. Uh, I saw the CEO of uh, Woodside on uh, one of the uh, business channels um, uh, being interviewed uh, recently and, and one of the answers to a, a, a particular question from one of the reporters was uh, listen it's all about it's all just a, um, a, a question of risk management and and there are organizations like Woodside uh, that you know they've been having decision-making tools helping them with managing risk for a very long time decades and decades and and they get it and then there's ones at the other end of the spectrum who still think risk is something that the risk person does. Uh, not sure that it's any value other than providing, you know, ticking the box on compliance uh, or providing comfort to the board. Uh, and even just as recently as last week, I'm, I'm about to do a risk workshop with a, a, a board and exec team, and I asked the risk manager about some of the board directors, and, and, the, and the person said, uh, "Yes, well, this is the these are the two people I'm worried about. Why is that? Because they." Are technical with me on the risk stuff. They know this stuff on risk, and so when we talk about things like risk appetite, they want it to be done in a certain way. But we've already established that it doesn't actually mean anything in terms of the decision making of the board. Yeah. So it's it's still it's still a mixed it's still mixed. To answer your question a little bit more broadly about what's been there has been great push by the risk profession here to make it simpler, and quite a big push to stop using risk in our language just to talk about business. And so instead of whacking risk in front of another thing, yeah. um, just talk about it as appetite for business. Why is it has to be risk appetite? What's your appetite for doing business? Yeah. So so it is mixed, um, and but I think the profession has done a good job of pushing us in the right direction, but there's still plenty of people that need yeah, to do yeah. Well, there are so many different directions we can, uh, we can take take this conversation. And one of the, one of the things that kind of uh, is big for me, because I, I am what you would consider a professional risk manager. I know nothing else because I have a degree in risk management. That's my undergraduate degree. Um, a degree which uh, Monash University cancelled soon after I've done it because they realized that risk management is not a profession in itself. There's more to it. Uh, luckily, I've got a second degree in statistics, so I have at least some, some fallback. Um, but the risk profession and, and just in general risk management, there's, I mean, understandably, the kind of the country national risk management associations they are trying to push the agenda that it's, it's a profession because that's their client base they have to they, they, they have to say those things which is understandable um, but you've been working a lot with executives who probably don't see risk management as a full-time profession rather they see it as a decision-making tool for any person really in the workplace anybody who's faced with a decision that has a lot of uncertainty associated they would benefit from some sort of risk analysis. How's 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 that? How's it looking? How are executive uh, buying into the whole concept that risk management is a tool to help them make better decisions? You've got some who would, you know, the usual standard thing. Risk management is what I do all the time. You know, we, we're always talking about risks, and uh, I have a little saying to them though that I say in the mining sector here in Australia when they took safety your head on. Um, it became well known that if someone breached safety on site, they and they were flown in from somewhere. They got flown straight home. They didn't even go back to their quarters to pick up their bags. They got sent straight home. And I'd say to senior execs, um, the reason you're doing that, right, is because of the welfare of those of those people. Well, are not the strategic decisions that you make um, also about their future welfare? Yeah. And why don't you hold yourself to the same level of accountability? So while they say that they manage risk and, they, and there's a lot of analysis and a lot of things go into it, 
Um, my experience is there's still this gap, not in the ones I'm talking about that have got it yet, but I'd say the big middle, at least half, if not 70%, where they are doing it informally and without, without enough thought into, and bringing in some of the benefits of risk where you actually measure it better, even if it's just likely than consequence, and I know that there's some, some terrible ways I'm and a big results fan of that. <laughs> that can come, but, but measurement certainly, uh, I, I believe I'm pushing uh, strongly. Just one more thing on that. Uh, I, I say to them when I when I run, let's call it education sessions before before I run the actual workshop, for example. Yeah. I say my number one mantra is we only do this to be successful. And if we keep that in mind, we're only going to do enough risk management to be successful, and we won't do too little. So, if you're not 100% successful as an organisation or as an individual now, and you'd like to manage uncertainty a little better. I know this really great process, <laughs> and let me help you. And that usually opens them up to all the other things that flow. So, yeah, yeah the, the, there's there's some that are definitely writing it and, and going down, uh, working harder at it, mm -hmm. and there are still plenty of others yet yeah. to be convinced. And how are how are the risk managers? Not not just in Australia specifically. So we're doing kind of pick on them, but in general from the conversations that you've seen, because you've got a pretty big online presence, which is more global than just Australia. Um, how are risk managers? Are they catching up? Are they kind of on top of the decision making, or are they still stuck in the old paradigm where risk management is about managing risks and you have to do it quarterly or monthly, but not when the actual decision is being made? Certainly outside the, um, there's two parts to it. There's the finance sector, which is our, APRA is our regulator of banks, superannuation funds, insurance companies. They push uh, a lot of regulatory burden on people. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of compliance activity going on. And so while you've got um, uh, ANZ Bank with 62 million spent on, on FTE per annum, that's not the case anymore, they've cut it. Yeah. Um, just to meet the needs of the regulator. There's not a lot of quality conversations going on, right? Yeah. But some of the people in finance and the good risk managers that I talk to around town, they are having the quality conversations. They're saying, Alex, let's let's meet up, um, uh, let's talk about the project, uh, and just help people go through that process of going a little bit more formally. How are we handling uncertainty on this one? So there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work, and they're also probably the ones saying, I don't use risk in the conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. just a great quality conversation. Yeah. And you, you, I, I've, I've heard that you're about to publish your second book. Uh, what is it about? What are some of the key messages? Interestingly, it's about conversations. It's called Winning Conversations, How to Engage, Even About Risk or Bad News. Uh -huh. And it's built um, uh, uh, basically is to help people understand my Pathfinder model. It's a Pathfinder model because it helps find the path through all the psychological biases that people have to their decision making. Yeah. Because when you think about influencing, when you're trying to influence someone, what are you trying to influence them to do? Well, to decide the way that you want. So you're just trying to influence a decision. And we've known forever that, well, sorry, we've been studying for decades and decades that we have psychological biases because of our genetics, yeah. because of our current environment, and because of the values mum and dad um, and, and co brought yeah. us up, yeah, yeah. the village brought us up to. And those three things are constantly battling. And and those biases create blind spots, mm -hmm. blind spots to good thinking. And so the Pathfinder model helps people find the path for those they're trying to advise. Yeah. So my target audience for it is anyone who wants to have a winning conversation, yes, but really it's about the internal advisors and organisations yeah. who are often being told, hey, Talk to the hand. Talk to the hand. Yeah. You know, I'm too busy. I'm getting on. I've got to get this job done. And you want me to fill out a form, or you want me to do this, or you want me to do that. So it's helping them be better influencers, so they can have the impact they want yeah, to have. Yeah. Well, one thing uh, I think is kind of now becoming uh, an accepted fact, which wasn't really a few years ago, is that uh, if we're talking about integrating risk management into decision making, we have to leave and accept the reality of decision making, which is a uh, quite a complex process because humans are not inherently built for decision making and B, humans in general are not that good at making decisions under uncertainty. There is plenty of scientific research which suggests that we are uh, subject to a lot of shortcuts which are you know, our cognitive biases uh, and risk management 
in our kind of analysis, risk management could be one of those tools that kind of helps overcome cognitive biases. I mean, when I when I talk to people, I basically you know, there's the research on system one and system two thinking, the fast and slow thinking, and essentially what risk management, some of the risk management tools like decision trees, all they really do is they force people to switch from system one quick thinking, which is all driven by shortcuts and kind of you know, get lost Get, get, get lost things to system two thinking, which is your slow analytical thing. But unless you kind of force yourself to do it, you, you won't, because it's it's difficult, it's resourceful, it takes a lot of energy and glucose. So risk management helps do that. Is that what your Pathfinder model is all about? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You, you when we were talking about this earlier when we were walking over here, about the need, first of all, to find something in it for them. But then you've got to couch your argument in such a way that so so decision making is hugely emotion driven. Yeah. So let's tick that box. You've got to attract your emotion. But we're advisors. We live and die by our advice. So you might be able to get someone to emotionally make a decision today, but if that advice doesn't prove fruitful for them, and if you can't continue to give it good advice, then you won't be their trusted advisor down the track. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you're continually showing them the way, and so you need different tools. And risk management absolutely is. In my book, the first book, Decide, um, the, the second part of, the, um, of my MCI decision model is clarification. Guess what it is? It's just risk analysis. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but I didn't call it that, because people wouldn't read the book uh, <laughs> if they were a senior executive. Um, whereas, uh, uh, you know, when it's a book on decision making, those that have understand how difficult it is, yeah. lap it up. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, and do you see that risk managers as professionals, they're now kind of beginning to recognize that there's, there's obviously a, a, a lot more to risk management than just uh, doing the risk assessment, but more importantly, that there's a lot of useful tools and techniques and answers that risk managers need to be applying in the fields just outside of risk management. Decision theory, Neuroeconomics with all the cognitive biases, corporate finance. I, I don't think um, I'm seeing as much of that. In Australia, a lot of the senior risk positions are actually joint audit and risk, uh, and hence why there has been such a uh, emphasis, I think, on the compliance aspects of it. Uh, it's an unfortunate aspect of, uh, I think, where people in organisations like the RMIA, of which I was president and I was part of. Um, and, and I was associated with, with some of the bad years that we had, we, 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 we allowed, I think, the accounting firms to uh, hijack us, the, the profession, a bit too much and, 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 and went down the audit agenda. And to the accounting firm's credit now, they are trying to bring everyone back and talk about decision making and strategy and, 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 and listening as a self from a compliance activity. Yeah. Are, they, are they really? I don't, I'm not well, sure. Well, in their, in their papers, yeah. but not necessarily does it do their cash flow rec um, um, uh, reflect it because yeah. I think a lot of the cash flow is still on the, you know, the compliance regulatory yeah. driven, yeah. driven things. Um, but here's an example. I got contacted by a senior, risk, the, the top risk person in a very large Australian uh, listed company. Uh, 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 and they report to the CFO. So there's an example of a very yeah. senior person, but they're only reporting to the CFO. They're yeah. not in the C-suite. Yeah. No disrespect to them. And they also have the audit function. And the CFO had said to them, so what? So what? I've got a uh, strategic risk profile now. Terrific. What does it mean for my balance sheet? Yeah, yeah. So, yes, there are questions being asked. You know, executives don't want to waste time and money. And the smart ones are asking that of the risk function. Yeah. So what? Show me what it means for my decision making, and if I'm the CFO, it's about the balance sheet. Does this mean that I've got to take more risk, so I've got enough money to protect my balance sheet in the future? Yeah. Or should I take less risk, because I've got reserves I don't want to lose, because I'm in a good position? Yeah, yeah. What does my um, uh, strategic risk profile tell me? And by the way, you've got 30 on the Monaheek map, how are they interrelated? Yeah. So there's, there's that, lots that of is, challenges. That, that is such an important point. Um, because I've, I've written an article which says, are risk managers scared of taking risks? And, and it's basically all about, uh, I, I, was, I was in the Middle East and I was just I was so sick of um, nobody at the conferences and in, in personal meetings 
going, oh, but I'm an expat, like I can't, I can't really shake the boat, I can't really propose new methodologies and integrate into decision making, which I thought was just so outrageously insane that I decided to write this article. And the whole idea is that there's a very small window of opportunity for risk managers now because executives are now picking up on the value of integrating risk into decision making. And sooner or later, many CFOs, CEOs, will start asking, so what that you've given me this heat map, I can still make decisions the way I was making it. It has zero impact. In, in fact, we can get rid of the heat map and it will not change our decision making in, in any way. It will not, will not change our budgeting or procurement or investment activity. I was in a, in a different podcast. Uh, I did tell that story, but basically that same thing happened to me when the CEO said, you've done such a wonderful job. I, see, I can see a lot of colorful documents, but so what? I'm the CEO, I should be waking up every morning and wanting to look at your shit map, but I don't. Like something just doesn't mm -hmm. attract me to that, so w w what's, the, what's the point? Why do we need risk management which has absolutely no impact on my activities as a CEO? And surely it's, it's kind of in risk manager's power to either start changing the thing slowly himself or sit there silently and wait until somebody asks the question. And it's much more beneficial to kind of to be driving change yeah. than then having to um, come up with excuses on why haven't we changed already so far. The, 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 the best risk managers I've met are change agents. They are trusted by their, their chief executives and the, and the rest of the executives. And they do push buttons in a good way. They ask the right questions. And unfortunately, too many risk managers are exactly as you say, this is my, what I do, this is part of my job, this is what I do. And when I have conversations with them about doing things differently, there's very few, one in two in ten maybe, one in five, or maybe even one in ten, are, are wanting to have no more and go down that pathway. Yeah. Um, because they, and those ones are generally maybe a receptive boss, so they're in out. And then some people I've talked to, oh no, my boss is really good, CEO is really good, came from such and such, where they were really big on risk. And he's sort of standing around here going, or she's saying, well, where, where's all the risk stuff? This, you know, I, I want yeah. what I had before. So yeah, it is spreading, the word is getting out. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, I think I like that. We, we need a lot more risk managers to take a risk. Is it, and I, I argue in the in the article that it's actually much more dangerous to not do anything and then having to track back and explain why you missed the opportunity rather than at least probe and say two years later say I told you so yeah, that's yeah. what I've been telling you all the time and you didn't listen so you're already in the winning position yeah yeah and, and even the that example that you gave with the CFO I think is is a fascinating one because there's one thing talking to the CFO about a risk profile with fifty or thirty high risks. Which, which is actually, I don't think there's any way you can make that meaningful to the CFO because what you could be talking to the CFO is saying in 2019 we have a potential liquidity gap in your own budget because we run some scenarios on your budget or there's a very high probability and you can kind of give them the actual numbers that this budget will not be met within the next year and by so much within like a 95% constant confidence interval. Risk managers actually have the tools to talk to the CFO about CFO stuff, not risks. CFOs don't really care about risks, except the few risks that they have to manage from a legislative point of view, which is you know, foreign exchange, liquidity, and so on. There's so much potential in the tools that are available to the risk managers, which many are ignoring, you know, sticking to the kind of easier likelihood consequence type perspective. Um, but what I have found is that when you kind of say A, and say we will integrate into decision making, immediately B comes along. But first B comes along saying that decision is all about decision making is all about people and hence you better understand how human brain works and how human humans behave and what drives them and what really motivates them. But then immediately C comes along and is that here's the budgeting process and uh, you want to analyze the effect risks have on the budget and there's a very limited time frame. It's not enough time to do a proper risk workshop, interviews, and then do a risk report. So you, you actually need other tools, like CFO is already using. They're using scenarios, they're using sensitivity analysis. That's, that's risk management. Uh, half an hour before we met, I had a phone call with the CEO. Now, the risk manager had brought me in because the CEO had asked the question. We've done this financial modelling 
on this deal. What else should we be modeling? What else should we be measuring? And he put it to her, and, and uh, she's been following my blog for, for a long time, and she got in touch, and there's something you can help with, absolutely. And just, so we've gone down the path of, I took them back a little bit and said, well, let's introduce the board and, and the senior management to what this could be at, at, a, at a senior level. And now we're going down that path of measurement. And interestingly, just at the same time, he's then asked the question, hmm, I'm looking at my KPIs for my strategic plan. I'm not so happy with them anymore. And I said, interestingly, uh, Mr. CEO, um, I've just teamed up with a, uh, a colleague of mine who's an adjunct lecturer at uh, applied statistics at Sydney University. He's a data guy, uh, Dr. Andrew Prattley. And his motto is, it's not about big data, it's about your data. And so I've teamed up with him and what we're saying to organisations, we can help you measure what matters. Mm -hmm. An engagement survey is one thing. Yep. Financial analysis is one thing. But what is the true capability, capacity of your organisation? Because, you know, you take an appetite statement, appetite for business. It's based on the assumption of the capacity of the organisation to take it on. Yep. Take on risk. And, of course, it's an assumption because no one knows for sure. But most organisations have very little true measurement. They find out down the track when the KPIs or the KRIs, if they got them, um, uh, sending alarm signals. Yep, yep. So um, measurement is certainly something that's got to come. And with the world of AI, machine learning, yep. how, how can it not? How can it not? Yep. And even, even without going into such complexities, we already, since 1970s and 50s and 60s, we have plenty of tools that allow us to measure uncertainty, yeah. even now. The, uh, I, that remind, your story reminded me of uh, something that happened to me, which I kind of, that's when I felt that risk, and hence I and my team made some impact. And that was when um, our, our sovereign fund had a subsidiary, which was technically outside of my scope. And they, uh, the subsidiary was trying to get an approval from our CEO, which happened to be their CEO as well, um, an approval for a five-year strategy. So they brought the financial models, all the projections, uh, forecasted KPIs for the next five years to the CEO. And the CEO said, I'm not comfortable with this. This is overly optimistic. This is just completely unreal. You have not taken proper consideration of risk. Why don't you, even though it's outside of the technical scope, why don't you go and speak to our risk guys? Because they will look at your, they will model some scenarios together with you and then you present something to me which is kind of went through the risk lens and then I will feel much more comfortable about approving this five-year multi-million dollar strategy um, because at the moment I feel super uncomfortable. And it was, it was a fascinating exercise because it was the first time CEO sent us something as opposed to us convincing him why we should constantly yeah, look at all yeah. the models and budgets, he sent us something to do. And so when we started, it was just completely fascinating. So one of the, one of the major business assumptions was there was um, expected return on a certain kind of um, investment asset. And we, so we're asking uh, the team, so what's, what's, what, what do you expect? You, how much money do you expect to make? And they go, well, currently we've put in like 35%. And we're going like, okay, but we're trying to introduce some scenarios, so let's do like a range. What's your range? And he goes, well, like between 20 and 60%. That's how much we believe we will make money on this particular type of project. And we're going, fine, we, we believe you, but let us, let us verify, because that's what risk managers does. They do, they do homework. So we've done the homework. We found in Bloomberg some relatively comparable, uh, close enough uh, investment types, and the average return, historic return, was minus 20 <laughs> to 5. So basically, it's a, it's, a lo it's a losing money asset most of the time with a very small upside. Yeah. And, and we come back to them going like, well, your initial projection of like 20 to 60% upside doesn't really hold true. Like, let, let's maybe reconsider. And that's when the whole model started falling apart, obviously. So they had to change the strategy. And that's what mismanagement, I believe, is all about. When you start applying that to the real tangible things, the strategy changes because people are so inherently over optimistic mm -hmm. and ignorant of some risks. Mm -hmm. it, it's just it's, it's like it's a little tree, and you do you give it a little shake, and it, it, immediately all the leaves are falling falling down. Uh, 
and the tree changes. Our stra their strategy changed when we added risk to our strategy at the time. That strategy changed as well. Risk is is such a powerful tool that when you add it to decision making, um, not because risk is amazing, but because humans are so predictably rational. Yes, <laughs> which is the fun fun bit. Yeah, it's certainly there's a couple of things there. One is when I do a fair bit of government work. And there's a lot of complaint about uh, government from within people I talk to in government about risk aversion. So rather than being overly optimistic, they're overly pessimistic about what the minister or, or, or what wants or what could be done in a time frame, uh, and, and that it, it just flows on and more yeah. pessimism. And so, in, in many departments, things don't flow too quickly. Uh, so it works both ways. But what you were saying about the CEO saying to risk, go and have a look at it, herein lies a problem and also a shift that's been happening. Uh, the risk people got known as the fun police, right? Because that's exactly right. We came in and looked at things and said, excuse me, but that doesn't look too good and that doesn't look too good, that looks crazy. Uh, and so we get a bad name, right? Um, but, and that's because most of the decisions that have been uh, discussed at the board of the exec, the decision's already been made by someone. And along comes someone from risk, poking yeah. holes in it, and we get a bad name. So it used to be um, people would come to me and say, how do I get the CEO to listen to me? Now there's a lot more of, how do I convince the business to come to me earlier so I can help them yeah. early enough? Yeah. That's a more common question I get now. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot more CEOs that, that get the potential for bad decisions and are happy for people to do the right thing to get it right. Yeah. But I think a lot of the, uh, the people who are overly optimistic haven't got the value yet and so they, they don't come early enough. And that's certainly the focus of, with my book winning conversations to help yeah. more people. Uh, that is a very, very right. important message. Uh, I mean, that's the reality of risk management. If you're only talking to people once a quarter or once a month, You've guaranteed to miss all the decisions. All the risks have already been taken. And the, and the best you can say is that yesterday you've taken a bad decision. I mean, nobody's going to love you for that. No. With integrating into the actual decision-making process, and this is why it's so important to not have a complex process which runs on some sort of schedule, but rather have many different risk managements that kind of stick in different decision-making points, that you actually have time and tools to do something before the decision is being made and say, yes, you can still go ahead and do that decision, but if you change some of the wording in the contract, or if you change some of the assumptions that you've made, you would actually increase significantly the chances mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the making that decision good. And, and from the organizations I've worked with either for a longer period of time or I've um, come back after you know two, three years um, that have got it and run with it, while they might not be using the tools that we're talking about. They started having the conversations. So the whole flow of the year was a lot more of the conversations about what are the risks on this? And and hopefully now, what are the risks and how are we going to turn them into opportunities? Because it's not just about risks, it's about the opportunities we haven't even thought of that this process will create for us. I think I think that's one of the, where risk is so undersold. Yeah. The, a good process ends in creating more idea of opportunity for, for the decision makers yeah. and they can do more than they, they ever dream. Well, in, in fact, this is why I'm such a big fan of the kind of the better risk management tools because Monte Carlo simulation scenarios, decision tree, sensitivity analysis, that actually all, all of these tools don't show you risks. They show you the whole distribution of potential outcomes. And immediately you see the upside, the downside, you see everything. And that's, uh, for, like for me and some of the other risk managers, it's a, it's a normal conversation to talk about the whole spectrum of things as opposed to, here is our list of our risks, here is a list of our opportunities, it's just, it's an encompassing thing. Any single issue may be, may be turned into something positive or negative depending on the, on the circumstances. But you did say something um, very interesting which uh, I want to pick up on because this is something that risk managers are just not thinking about. And it reminded me, I did a presentation to the um, dean of one of the universities, one of the biggest universities in, the, in Asia, in Central Asia. And uh, um, he basically said, we're a government-funded university, but we're brand new, we're focusing on innovation, and we're, kind of, we're driving the agenda that we are 
better suited for the workplace than traditional old Soviet universities. And uh, um, he's saying the problem I have with stuff is that they're scared of taking risks because they're scared of Ministry of Education doing some audits on them and then uh, complaining and giving them all the different uh, different issues. Um, he said, I want to teach my people to take more risk, but not just blind taking risk, but understanding the risks that they're taking, understanding that the risks are acceptable and necessary to do proper business and go ahead and take those risks. I mean, this is what Hans Lisa, the ex-CRO of, of Lego calls, he calls it informed risk taking. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I mean, this is what risk management is all about, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's uh, understanding what risks you are taking mm -hmm. and feeling comfortable and brave about taking uh, taking those risks. I, I'd say it's taking risks eyes wide open. Exactly. And and I say to these you, you can take any risk you want. I don't care. It's not my position. I'm just trying to help you go in with your eyes wide open so that you know that if you if it all comes up and stuck you are either really unlucky because it was a low chance that it was going to happen or well it was almost inevitable anyway. <laughs> because you knew that you were taking extremely high risk or somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, but you're right. What, anything can happen. We can't predict the future. So all we can do is narrow it down, uh, corral it, uh, and, and do our best. And as um, uh, Nassim Talib says in his book, The Black Swan, es essentially, because we can't predict the future, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't bet the house. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, too many organisations do. I mean, let's talk about entrepreneurs for a second. They bet the house, um, more or less. They might not bet every dollar of the house, but they, they bet everything on, on their, you know, their tech startup, for example. Yep. I went to a tech startup talk a couple of years back, or 18 months ago, and three of them, they were all from the um, Sydney University Business School. Um, and uh, they were all asked at one point, you know, how tough would it have gone? Got, and every one of them had stood at the abyss. Every one of them stood at the abyss. But what they didn't say is they didn't look, they didn't say what they saw when they looked down. And what they saw down there was the broken bones of all the other failed entrepreneurs. Yeah, thousands and thousands. <laughs> they didn't make it. And that's not to say, don't go and be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Just do it eyes wide open yeah. and go as hard as you can and break through. And if you're passionate enough, you've got your best chance. But do it eyes wide open and if you bring in a little process of risk management to it, you're going to have a better shot. Yeah, exactly. I used to be a head of risk for one of the uh, techno parks and incubators, as one of the biggest incubators in Russia. And I've been spending a lot. They had a portfolio of 1,000 small startup companies and I was spending a lot of time with them, basically giving them just the two tools, which was the quick checklist, what are the risks to look out for, and the decision tree to kind of help them navigate, uh, and actually three, and the bow tie, and that was yeah. to understand how to resolve a particular issue. And that's what what will help make them, uh, turn them into you know, risk yeah, yeah. managers or more risk educated yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah, I, I just had a conversation on Thursday night with a lady from one of the um, hubs. In fact, she was um, from FinTech Australia. Um, and uh, she's actually married to um, that's association, FinTech Association of Australia. She's actually married to um, one of your interviewees, um, Gavin Pearce, actually. Uh, lovely lady. And uh, we were talking about what's happening in the hub. I'm going to go and meet with her and um, give me some more ideas of what I can talk to her about. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they, they they, they, are, they are the most vulnerable because they're faced with so many decisions and every decision for a small company is a, you know, it is a life or death matter for the company. And they're faced with so many decisions, they need very simple tools to kind of help yeah, them yeah. navigate so yeah, yeah. navigate That's along the way. Good idea, I owe you one. <laughs> Please. What's... Uh, um, What's the people are what, what what advice would you give to like young people thinking of moving into the risk space? Uh, I think um, I think it can be a very fruitful space. Uh, certainly, you know, the people who are spending a lot of money in the finance sector on risk people, um, when they get a good one, they they pay for them and they and they hang on to them because a good risk person not only is good at what we're talking about here, they do make a lot of the compliance stuff go away, make it less complicated and less difficult and therefore less costly to the yeah. organisation rather than people who want to be technically correct about stuff all the time. Uh, so there's definitely scope. Now, 
government has been pushing risk, regulators have been pushing risk, our ASIC, our, our corporate, um, at least the company, regu or company regulator, yeah. is pushing uh, risk more than it ever has before. So I can only see upside for people if they go about it the right way. And I don't care what your background is. I met risk managers who um, who ran all kinds of different worlds. I met a guy recently who um, has got a hobby farm. And it's what he's been doing for ages, and I think he had sort of a uh, ag, ag background, and now he's a risk manager for for a, uh, a government department. So don't don't be frightened. If you pursue and you're passionate about it, there's a, a world of fun out there, and I think you know. Alex, what you're pushing uh, quite rightfully is is where these people should be thinking. What what can I do that's outside the norm of revised ISO 31000, which has got some good principles and you know it help people. But at the end of the day, um, people read the standard and go, well, I need a risk matrix that looks like the standard or the the, 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 the ancillary documents around the standard. And uh, uh, and that's not what it's about. It's about saying to you, well, what what can I get smart about to help people uh, open their minds and make better decisions? And, and as you know, there's uh, there's a myriad of myriad of ways. I'm I'm adding tools all the time to my workshop toolkit because of the different industries. Um, so a not-for-profit will want something different to a for-profit. Agriculture wants something different to construction because the tools, some of them are quite generic, but others don't work so well and you need variation. So I'm always on the lookout for a good tool. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity to a young person wanting to get in. Oh, and here's the num number one, sorry, number two thing, number three thing, wherever we got to, is read. And it doesn't mean read a blog, it doesn't mean read the news, it means read some of the books. You know, uh, one of my big changes in my career was when I started reading risk books rather than just doing risk with people. Starting with um, uh, Bernstein's, um, what's that one the, called? Um, Amazing uh, history of risk management. Yeah, yeah. yeah the uh, the uh, yeah. gods against the gods. Against the gods. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. So, so I read that one. I've read you know, a couple of Kahneman's. Uh, and then when I got into the decision making thing, I read all the, you know, even Dan and Chip Heath, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Plough, uh, he's a German guy, and uh, Gisinger, um, yeah, I've, I've just read so many, and they're all quite intriguing. Oh, and Herbert A. Simon, 1947, he wrote the book, uh, Organisational Behaviour. What a read! That was the one that really opened my mind about decision making. Yeah, and you know, while it's got many editions rerun, um, uh, I still learned things about him and what, what what his teachings. Just recently, I didn't know that he'd said, um, "If you want to be, it, it, it's okay to be uh, a gut decision maker in certain um, in certain situations." And that is when you've got 50,000 bits of information processed over 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so if you've seen a strategic decision 50,000 times over 10 years, or all aspects to it, then you can make a gut feel with the strategic yeah, yeah, decision. Yeah, yeah. Until then, uh, let's try system two thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. better have a systematic process. And essentially, this is what risk management is all about. It's giving, you, giving our brain a systematic step-by-step -step process or algorithm so we can switch on system two thinking and avoid all, all yeah. the... All, all, all the common devices and, and things that are blocking in our brain. And, and but I, I must emphasise, and, I, and uh, I, I know you know it, but we all forget. Uh, a logical argument means nothing to someone emotionally not ready to listen. And unless you can get something inside their head that, that, that um, uh, opens their mind, yeah. makes them feel good about making a decision yep. and then giving them the logic in a nice way uh, then that's that's when people and you you start having making the impact that you know you can make yeah absolutely Th that is well i mean that is very interesting because this is what this is what my wife is pushing for for years i mean as if you've seen any of my videos or any of my work i am purposefully controversial and I um, make fun and ridicule certain practices uh, and you know, genuinely saying I'm much more aggressive than you would normally be in similar circumstances. Um, 
and and she's always saying like you have to find the key to people and like that's not because a lot of a lot of people really close they they don't want to listen to my argument because they are outraged or offended or you know many other um, emotions that they feel and, and and yet you know I lose I lose a lot of people because they don't they don't get to my message all, all my videos start with saying something is bullshit but there's a better way many don't get to the best but there is a better way um, and, and yet on kind of statistically I see that the number of subscribers is ex expanding exponentially the number of followers like thousands and thousands, I don't know, like 20,000 followers now um, so it seems that sometimes like somebody has to somebody has to be the you know the bad guy and yeah. take take the controversial route because you yeah. with just getting into people's mind first it's very individual like you would not have time to get into everybody's mind it's too individual approach um, and many people just don't just don't learn because yeah. I mean I've been talking about integrating to decision making for seven years now yeah. and it really didn't make a lot of impact yeah. until I wrote my first article which was risk management used to be uh, an art then it became in, si in science now it's just bullshit yeah. and, and that suddenly yeah. that had like you know, 30,000 views or something, right? or something wow. yeah. so it, it kind of it's it's weird yeah, yeah. what you're saying is obviously right when you yeah. are inside the company and you do have to find yeah, yeah. an approach and you can't really ali alienate yeah. people too much because yeah. you know they will close and yeah, that's it yeah. you've lost them yeah, yeah. but in the general public I guess I guess I'm this <laughs> well you, you, you know you're not doing it personally they don't have to watch the video um, interestingly in the, the training program I run to help people with their influencing skills um, uh, I was just recently, so it was the Pathfinder model, it includes so stand in their shoes, paint them a picture, tell them a story and make them believe. And I, I, I run through those four steps and mind you, the step where people are most shocked is when I get them to stand in their shoes with the tools I, I teach, they're quite shocked about how much they don't know about the person. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I had quite a few lawyers in the room and I was talking about having to paint pictures and this lawyer said to me, but I write advice. I said, yes, but we just went through the, the background to it that um, uh, using um, images in presentations and discussions increases the retention rate of, of the memory from 10% after three days to 60% in, in, in three days. So six times the retention rate in three days. I think that that's something that you could be looking into. Plus that other research, I forget who's it by, where uh, only 7% of a conversation, um, the impact of the conversation comes from the actual words. Yes. So um, I said to her, with all due respect to your profession, I think maybe it's time that the legal profession had a look at itself. Now, you can, you know, I said it as nicely as I possibly could, uh, but I think, you know, and, and I hang around with quite a few people that, that are saying authenticity is, is now. We can't have any more of the bullshit, you know. Um, people will, will respect you more for your authenticity. Now, you know, that's put my, my um, uh, evaluation for that one person down, <laughs> or a couple of lawyers in the room. Yeah. But boy, it shot it up for others because mm. that's what they're all thinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, you, you can't win yeah, all the look, time. I, so I, 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 I admire you and, um, and congratulate you for for, <laughs> for, for, for putting it out there. Um, and um, I, um, uh, I, I agree with so many of the things you've said. The, the, it's interesting um, the one about saying a lot of people pushing don't use risk in language. There is a place for it. <laughs> and it's evidenced by a, a, a TV show here, a current affairs show here called Four Corners, I think it was just last week, last month, probably a week ago today. And um, uh, it was on climate change. And in a uh, half hour or whatever it was, 20 minute, half hour segment on climate change, I reckon the, the word risk was used oh, 400 times. It was incredible. So people. It does pay attention. Risk does pay attention to people mm. in the right context. Yeah. Risk management is, yeah. a, is a different thing. That's true. So, yeah, definitely choosing the right time. Yeah. And and look, there's no doubt about the the tick the box stuff that goes on, and it just drives me crazy. And I and I do see, you know, I talk about the good senior manager, senior risk people. Well, I also talk to a lot of senior risk people who aren't so good. And uh, and I know that they're not the first person that the uh, well, not even the top five. 
people the, the CEO calls when they uh, are thinking about a big decision? Oh, I would say, have they ever received a call from the CEO? It's probably more like it. Yeah. 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 Well, I've um, I've I've been with the uh, sovereign fund where I was ahead of risk for just over three years, and I've. I've observed an interesting transformation, which, which again, kind of to me was like, okay, so risk management is actually making an impact. Um, when I just joined, nobody used the word risk ever in any kind of uh, context and any kind of conversation. Then about a year and a half later, I've noticed that executives, we had uh, Monday, Monday morning where all the executives were listening to all the next, next level directors. So there was about 60 people in the room and it was like a debrief for the week up front. Um, and people started using the word risk, but like completely missing the point. But completely incorrectly in wrong sentences, wrong ideas. And I'm going like, okay, like it's, I can see progress, so I will continue working and, and reinforcing the culture. But clearly I haven't done my job yet. But then three, three years later, not only the word risk was started flowing around constantly, one of the executives even came up with the term he called de-risking. Like, let's take this, he was actually literally saying in the exec meeting, in the board meeting, he was saying, let's say, take this KPI and de-risk it. That basically meant, let's do risk analysis, run some scenarios on that KPI, and see whether this KPI is achievable or not. And if it's not, let's adjust it with risks in mind. So it's kind of, that's, he was basically saying, let's protect us, the executive, by committing to a lower KPI, because he realized there was so much risk associated with it. And then, something just completely mind-blowing happened. It was one, like, one of the upcoming strategy sessions, and one of the board members ordered his team to do a risk analysis and prepare a risk analysis on his proposed strategy. So when he presented the strategy to all the other executives and the other board members, he, uh, when I said board, I mean the management board. In, in Russia we have two boards, the supervisory, which is kind of your Australian board, and the management, they also called board. So he was basically an exec. And he presented his, his department strategy to the other departments and he had a whole section on risk. Those are the risks associated with my strategy. So those are the risks I'm willing to take to achieve the strategy. But if this, you know, if this happens, you have to be aware that there are risks associated. And I was just amazed. I was kind of super upset because he didn't call me to do it. Uh -huh. Because normally he did. Like his team is actually working very close with my team and we did a lot of risk analysis for them. Uh, but the fact that he went ahead and ordered risk analysis from his team, which they did, I mean, that is like the ultimate risk management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did risk ma risk analysis without yeah, the need yeah. for the risk manager. Yeah, yeah. No, but it doesn't really get much better than that. No, that's right. One self-sufficient. I mean, uh, that's one of the problems with uh, my business model is, uh, you know, when um, I finish with clients, they don't need me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which means you've got to continually get new ones. Yeah, yeah. You just reminded me of something around um, that analysis piece and, and shipping that can't, I, I, I missed it. That's all right. Um, any other things that you have on top of your mind that we haven't discussed yet? I think well, that was the one, and I'm just trying to get it back now. Um, maybe about where the profession's going. Maybe it was uh, about me saying something about de-risking the KPI. The language, yeah. Yeah, can't can't remember. But um, oh well, my, one of the latest things I'm doing is is talking about finding opportunity in board stewardship, and um, and what I'm saying to boards is if this is your situation, uh, you can't let it go on. And that is, um, we have a very full board agenda, and risk is down the bottom. Um, it gets pushed often or it gets uh, truncated all the time just about and all that happens when that risk person is not really up to it um, uh, makes a presentation is the board members are thinking, where could I possibly be other than here right now? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're not thinking that because they're too busy in the phone. Yeah, they're right, yeah. <laughs> and my brother-in-law, who's on a few boards, said, yeah, it's it's um, it's the silent cancer. And so I thought, okay, well, there's some opportunity in board stewardship because 
let's face it, the world's not getting any less complex. Yeah. Uh, we're well aware of the uh, challenges of decision making. And the board's role is to help steward the organisation. So the management board, the management exec team, fire on all cylinders. And there can't be time for any waste between the, the two parties. And, and, and ticking boxes and, and wasting people's time is, is definitely a missed opportunity. So I think um, in the boardrooms um, of many organisations, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that the shift will continue. And, and, I do, and I do remember saying this about, you know, I've been in this game for quite a while, and, and I, I used to say, You've got, you don't understand why it's so difficult at board level is because your average board, le- board person is, you know, in this country, white, Anglo, male, over 50. Um, and I've never heard of this rich stuff before, and they, so that's what we do all the time anyway. Of course that's changing over time and people are appreciating the, the value of diversity on boards for decision making and more and more. So it's getting easier and easier. Um, and I think coming back to earlier on in the conversation, just be aware of those technically correct directors yeah. or technically correct board and risk committee members that want it done in a certain way or a certain colour or a certain this because the standard said that. So and, none of the standards yeah, even say that, yeah, so it's, it's all made up. Yeah, and come back to what's going to help us be successful to challenge to, 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 in this challenging world of complexity yeah. and, and the difficulty of making decisions when we're all biased as hell. Hey, here's a confession to make. My first book, Decide, um, 60,000 words on decision making on my MCI decision model. Lots of stories in it. That's one of the good feedback I get is that people love the stories. Um, I got a, uh, I gave it to my, my friend um, uh, and his, his wife's American and she read the book on the plane from San Francisco or LA to Sydney and she sent me an unsolicited review. That was the subject, unsolicited review. Dear Brian, I love reading you. I read, had the pleasure of reading your book because I love da 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 but <laughs> she said, I've been to your website, I've looked at your testimonial. More than 40% of your testimonials are by women. I've, I can only remember three instances of you mentioning women uh, in, in, in the book of all, all these stories. Um, and I was gobsmacked. And my wife was gobsmacked. Uh, she proofed it three times and didn't pick it up either. And it just goes to show the level of unconscious bias that we have, particularly uh, around um, uh, 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 feminism, not feminism, but, but um, uh, sexism, sorry. Yeah. And, and, uh, and how we, we do it to ourselves and we don't even know. Uh, what was I going to say there? Um, uh, anyway, this book is very different. I've been determined to um, uh, give credit where credit's due and, and look, look differently. But um, I, 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 uh, I was going to say something else about it. I can't remember. But it was uh, it was a, it was a, a moment of truth for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something which which we're completely unconscious of. Um, you did some mention something about um, board reporting, which which reminded me of a story. I, I actually stopped reporting risk to um, to boards. Because I found there's a much better way. Just like with anything, I say board reporting unnecessary, uh, board risk reporting unnecessary. I never had to present to the board um, because the better way was I've changed how investment decisions were made and presented. So basically, every single investment decision that went before the board already had an element of risk analysis and it was completely transparent and disclosed. I changed the way budgeting worked. So we applied uh, risk modeling to our budgets and strategic plans. So all the most important documents that went before the board already included in a component, a very you know, well-written, long component of risk analysis, and I've changed how performance reporting was done. Yep. So when the CEO and the CFO, whoever was present at the time, reported on general business performance, which they did anyway every yep. quarter, I've recolored most of the performance metrics in risk. So they were saying, previously they were saying like we have 90 factors, factories. And they started saying we have 90 factories out of which uh, 30 are high risk, considered high risk, and you know, 30 are considered medium risk. And, and they basically changed the way they were communicating exactly the same things that added that extra dimension of, uh, of, of risk to it. And so I never had to report to the, to the board because the board already, every single agenda item they've discussed, they already had the risk information specific to that agenda yeah, item. Yeah. There, was, there was nothing 
there was no other ten risks that yeah. were to be discussed because they already covered everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that that worked quite well. Well, mainly because on our board there were ministers, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't really want to be in front of them too much. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, uh, I've basically delegated all of, all of risk reporting to the CEO and the investment teams, whoever were defending their investments. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's their risk. It, they should be reporting on it. And just um, just in a uh, workshop two weeks ago, I, I, I finished with, um, it was up on risk appetite, and I said to the CEO, and I said, by the way, with the board there, I said, it would please me no end if all of this was just incorporated in your normal business reporting and a risk report or risk appetite report is never seen of or heard again. Yes, you can revisit your appetite occasionally, um, but in terms of what's agreed you're going to you do and what are the measures that are going to indicate whether we're going to get there or not, um, well, wouldn't that be wonderful if that was just all part of it? And he's the one that's really picked that up and running with it. There are the smart ones out there and they're getting it. And he's a younger guy. You know, it's, it's definitely the ones with um, come up a bit more exposure to it. But uh, um, yeah, so there's there's hope. There's, there's, there's strong hope. hope. There's strong hope. You, you hear that? There's yeah. hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, Brian. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking time, and it's interesting. Uh, if you, if any of you have questions uh, for Brian, do reach him on the website, which is uh, brianwhitefield.com. Brian with a Y, white. Field.com. I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Perfect. And Alex, so, thank you so much. It's been uh, it's great to meet you in person after all this time. Um, actually, to tell you the truth, I'm, I've decided to do some videos myself. Um, so uh, you've inspired me some more, and um, and you really have made me think hard about um, authenticity and calling it for what it is. I'll see how um, how brave I get, but, um, um, but uh, I, I certainly am going to do a bit more. So this is an old white Anglo-Saxon guy uh, taking a little while uh, to uh, to get into the mainstream. And I, uh, oh. So anyway, Alex, thank you so much and um, uh, look forward to catching up again soon somewhere. Thank you, Brian.